Guten Tag. Guten Tag. Guten Abend. Hello and welcome to our next episode of Talk Real, broadcasted to you from here, uh, the Trans Europa Festival 2017 in Madrid. Today we will elaborate on the role of uh, cultural and artistic practices uh, in welcoming and including those who flee from home. Those who look to Europe as a refuge, a refuge from war, a refuge from poverty, environmental distraction and persecution. And I would say that meanwhile, um, art as a vehicle in order to get along with the challenges um, that people have that look to Europe as a refuge is uh, considered as a, yes, it's considered as a very good tool, right? Um, art is used to open up spaces uh, for encounters between the existing civil societies and the newly evolving civil societies. And finally, art is used um, to open up imaginaries, um, to open up semantics, change rhetorics, narratives of uh, how we see and how we talk about um, this crisis that I think is more a border crisis than a refugee crisis, as it's called. And um, today we have three people here that engage in this kind of endeavors. I would like to begin our discussion with Oliver Ressler. Oliver, um, you are uh, an artist that for decades now <laughs> is engaging with political issues. Uh, I remember 20 years ago when I was still studying cultural studies, you were already part of the syllabus of an example of a political engaged artist. My question would be, um, what are you, for you your leading formal and political principles doing work concerning the border and migration issue. What would you say is something that is working and what does work less? Hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you first. Uh, over the years I applied a variety of different tactics, so I'm not the kind of artist who finds a strategy and then applies the strategy uh, over a couple of years, so I'm uh, trying out different attempts and different formats and different ways of collaborating and different ways of addressing certain issues and of involving people. Um, in the 1990s, when I started to work on this field of racism, migration, borders, I worked a lot in collaboration with another artist, Martin Krenn, in public space. Uh, and we did lots of billboards or billboard objects uh, that uh, operated with language and with images and tried somehow to participate in an already existing discussion and bringing in certain aspects that we felt were, sign were kind of lacking. So the most well-known project we probably did uh, in 1997 was that we put uh, a three by three by three meter long billboard object in front of the Viennese State Opera in Vienna. Uh, and it referred to this, at that time, newly established uh, institution of detention centers uh, for asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. So we presented it as a kind of uh, institutionalized racism, the existence of it, and made this, uh, this, uh, this connection, which, uh, yeah, and, and we got a lot of attention on it, and it really shifted the discourse also a bit, at least, uh, over this period while it was there, which was quite long, six weeks. Mm -hmm. And you made um, three films in yeah, the last yeah. period on what is happening now. Yeah. Um, how is this work different than 20 yeah. years ago? In yeah, um, that's a very complicated question because also the three films, they rela relate on very specific uh, contexts. They try to find her way to respond to a very specific situation. And also the three films are different from each other. 
So uh, one of the films which is presented uh, here, for example, is titled uh, There are no Syrian refugees uh, in Turkey. And I was invited to produce this film for an exhibition I had at the Salt Galata in, in Istanbul uh, in uh, November 2016. And um, the idea of it was more or less to invite uh, a group of uh, Syrian refugees. The title, there are no Syrian refugees in Turkey, is because they, are not, they have no chance to apply for asylum and therefore, legally speaking, the refugees don't exist there, but there are, I think, three million Syrian refugees in Turkey, and it's the largest group of refugees in any nation states in this world. Um, so, um, usually, when refugees are allowed to speak in the public, they are meant to speak about personal experiences, about uh, the refuge uh, or the, the living situation in, 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 in Istanbul. The main intention of the film was uh, to, to open the space for, um, uh, for a political analysis on the one hand of the political situation in Turkey, but what interested me even more is the uh, political situation of this politics of exclusion of the European Union. Uh, and uh, so uh, the film functions more in this uh, case. Okay. Um... Which brings us to Rasha, Rasha Shaban, who is actually leading at the moment a project where um, people in refuge themselves are um, involved into storytelling. Um, Rasha, you're currently working at the National Museum of World Culture in Sweden as a project leader and coordinator of Anna Lind Foundation the largest civil society network in Sweden promoting intercultural dialogue between the countries of the north and the south of Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Very important job. Um, and among your activities, as I said, is IHOP project. So IHOP uh, is a mash-up word um, between the Swedish word IHOP, which, Ihop. Means, yeah. Ihop, which <laughs> means together, and HOP, which means hope. So in IHOP, um, you use actually digital storytelling in order to give voice to those who might not be present in public discourse. Um, maybe you can also yeah, describe this project, but also react to Oliver, who says uh, refugees are only entitled to talk about their stories. My question is also to whom you address these stories? Um, what public uh, are they supposed to be for? And uh, what feedback do you have? On, on this living archive of voices in refuge. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I hope it's an experience. Um, I've been working for many years and this project has been one of the most inspiring and life-changing projects that I worked on. Um, hearing stories about a Syrian man who fled after a bomb fell on their home with his child until they finally found a safe haven in Sweden. In contrast to that, you hear a story about a French tango dancer who talks mm -hmm. about one night when she goes out dancing in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. You hear the story of uh, a Syrian girl who's struggling to learn Swedish and another and another and another. Big diversity of stories. Each story means something to the person that is telling it. It's not more important if you talk about losing home. It's not more important than talking about your daughter who gave you happiness helping you in the kitchen because it's a memory that means something to you. Why digital storytelling? Unfortunately, we're living in a time now where refugees are just quotas, are numbers, are statistics. They come full of stories. They come full of rich culture. They hate the reality that they are now seen as refugees, part of an establishing program. They have to go through this, I have to learn the language, I have to bear the racism, the Islamophobia, the fear of the right wing, the fact that I'm living 15 kilometers away from the city center and so on. They carry stories. 
also the local community members, they have stories mm -hmm. to tell. Mm -hmm. And one of the complaints of refugees or newcomers, we, we never use the word refugees yes. actually in our project, we call them the newcomers, because this is gonna be their home in two or three years when they have the passport, or maybe after one week when they find the safe mm -hmm. haven or the safety, being home. Um, one of the biggest challenges of the newcomers to Sweden, they always say, we're not able to see the Swedish people, they are living in their own bubble, how can we get access to them? So this is why we said we're not gonna just work with refugees or newcomers in to go to refugee camps or asylum camps. We want to establish this intercultural dialogue. And this is why we said we're gonna bring the newcomers together with local community members. So and the, the local community members also um, do digital storytelling. Yes. yes. And then you collect the stories. Yes. And they are presented how? I mean, each story is one minute long mm -hmm. and it's a process. It's not just that you would come, sit here for a few hours, record the story and bye bye. Mm -hmm. No. It was a series of meetings because we tried to make this sense of community. We want to address a need mm -hmm. of the newcomers and the local community members who say, we also don't see the refugees, where are they? And I was so much into this project with all the subtitles and editing and getting people together and buying the food and all of this until the moment I did the first screening outside Sweden. Mm -hmm. I was in Tunisia in a cultural forum and I did the screening and I was so surprised. People stood up mm -hmm. and were clapping and I was like, wow, that was, <laughs> I didn't know it was that powerful, yeah. you know, until you really see the feedback yeah. that you get from the people. What I think is interesting is you said refugees, newcomers, I also have a big problem with the word actually, um, are only entitled to tell their personal story and not to talk about politics uh, and you try to shift this. And in your work, it's not only the newcomers who say the stories, but actually it's the whole society that is there in order to exchange their perspectives and then you show it back to this whole corpus of yeah. society. I think it's two uh, different interesting yeah. strategies. And you, Lucila, Lucila Rodriguez, you are the head of Por Causa. Mm -hmm. I pronounce well. Super. <laughs> <laughs> An organization which seeks to generate counter information regarding the border crisis in Spain and in Europe. And so, first of all, I would like you to talk a bit about the activities of Por Causa that, um, according to what I've been reading, aim to shift discourses and create new narratives on the issue. Por Causa was created like five years ago. Uh, in the middle of a very big crisis of narratives and uh, in my opinion of um, organizations that try to help other people because uh, it's very hard to help to make the world change and help other people lots of times you help them through charity and mm. I don't think we need charity I think we need rights so Por Causa is an organization that works on, based on a network, which is its strength, uh, through uh, reliable information that we get from research, top research, thanks to a network of universities and our own team. And uh, we also join, are joined by experts and journalists. And once we have the information, then we work with the media to spread it and we also try to get new ways of narrative so we can expre express in a very simple and nice way or different way uh, the information we got. And, and this is a journalistic is, uh, it, format? Is, uh, we use lots of formats. Our main format is journalistic because we really think information changes the world. When people get the information, normally they get an opinion of it and then they can change it. And we think information right now is a bit um, mess. It's messy because media don't have uh, money to have good, like strong uh, teams. So teams are very small. Journalists are working uh, on a rush and we're facing all these fake news and things. This is because there are no editors in the media. So what we do is, uh, and we are not the only ones doing that, it's like we try to be a plug of the media uh, with an expertise on migration. And 
did artistic or cultural practices uh, play a role? Of course. Sometimes, where do they help? Would you when, say? when I when I was talking about new ways of narrative, we use uh, lots of artistic expressions. Uh, for example, uh, we do um, artivism. Mm -hmm. We did. A, I invite you to visit the website. We did that was amazing. We went to this project. Uh, it was launched by uh, IKEA and uh, <laughs> the UN, and it was how architecture can change uh, the, the best idea, arch architectural idea, to change the, the life of uh, refugees. Mm -hmm. So we present a brochure like IKEA mm -hmm. about, with a wall, and it was how you unbuild the wall. So you had all, you know, all the tools to take out the wall, and at the end the wall was put on boxes. <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, I mean, the best thing you can do for refugees is take out the walls. It's not to build a house with uh, papers in the middle of a city. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to show. So we, we really work a lot with artists. We have a group of artists coming from a university here in La Juan Carlo, uh, Rey Juan Carlos, and uh, we work on different projects uh, involving art. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, in the last years I would say um, art became a tool, as you see here, um, and also a political tool, uh, and it also became a popular thing to do for artists. Um, there is uh, also a flip side on this popularity, there's a discussion going on at the moment to which extent artists actually uh, promote their own work and use uh, newcomers as artistic material in order to actually make a career on the back of this uh, tragedy. And uh, I would like to ask you, Oliver, since you are a prominent part of the art world, what um, you would say about this if uh, you are aware of this uh, danger of actually abusing mm. a tragedy, tra 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 tragedy. <laughs> in order to uh, make an artistic career and mm. how you try to prevent this. Mm. Yeah, as you, as you know, I, I started to work on this already a while ago when uh, it was not a very trendy uh, situation. There were really very, very few artists focusing on these issues at all. And I have a background as an artist, so I was trained as an artist in an art university. And for me, this was kind of the logical language of how I could kind of deal with these issues. I worked on some of these themes with involving uh, refugees or migrants. In other works, I found ways of not to involve, mm -hmm. but then I also did not speak about them. This is something I would reject. Mm -hmm. But then I focused uh, on the institutional problems, like, for example, on these detention centers for, for refugees. So I focused more or less on the state that establishes these things and, uh, and found another way to, to address these issues. In general, I see the, the risk uh, you describe and for myself, I try to very carefully to avoid uh, uh, creating kind of an exploitative situation, but on the other hand, to create kind of a platform from where people get the possibility to speak, speak from and, and present their positions uh, and I'm working in a way, so I, uh, I heard, for example, a couple of times that when I approach people and ask for an interview, first they say no, because they have so bad experiences with media and how what they say then has been cut down and presented in media. And then when I have a longer discussion and maybe also show some samples of works, they see that this is another approach so that uh, I really try to create space also for a full argument and not for a 30 sec second long uh, excerpt of an, of an argument. Uh, that uh, that would then be edited in a way to to support a narration that is not necessarily the speaker's narration. And yeah, yeah. Dasha, you are um, with the digital storytelling. You are evolving the people. I would say this is also another strategy. Those who make the art is not the artist themselves, but are actually those people who have had the experience of being in refuge and fleeing. Um, 
what is the difference, would you say? What makes, is the artwork made out of this process is different? I think it makes it more credible. Mm -hmm. I mean, w when we even present the project, we, we say like, you're gonna hear the voices. Our names or whatever comes really, really at the end. We don't promote it as the work of Rasha Shaban or Linda Ted's daughter, no. These are the voices of people who are going to tell you a story in one minute. Stories about love, about family, about loss, about dreams, about, um, yeah, I mean, many, several topics. So I think it's, it's this, is, this is what we needed. We needed to give them the voices. So um, you just need to listen mm -hmm. to them. Just yeah. need to listen yeah. to them. <laughs> While I was preparing for this talk, I was researching um, in the different European institutions. There is at the moment a lot of surveys done and a lot of reports talking about the impact of culture strategies in uh, the process of integration, as the European Union calls it, because, and I quote a recent report, welcoming and including the newly arrived is not only a matter of allocation of shelter and food, is also psychological, social, and emotional needs are equally important, they say. So already, also on the European level, um, these tools are being acknowledged, but um, there's always the talk about integrating the newcomers. So we have to work with them in order to um, uh, learn the, our culture to them, um, to teach our culture to them, to integrate them, to... Uh, to help them to accommodate. And I was thinking, why are we actually never talking about the fact that our societies as well have to learn a lot about receiving newcomers? Lucilla, is this something like that that you're doing to teach maybe the ones that are already here? Well, yeah, in fact, our message, our address to the uh, civil society, to the um, public. well, to the public, yeah, to the audience, to the global audience. So uh, somehow, yes, we're trying to convey message to them. Uh, what we're trying is to make the people understand uh, the process they are in about the creation of their uh, uh, mind and speech. So what we try is to show them how the speech is being made. Uh, we try to do studies that help the people to understand what is going on and have a real picture of it, and then they can choose. Uh, and you are completely right. Uh, you are all completely right there. For me, the mi big, big problem is to make a difference between us and someone else. Mm -hmm. So once you put the barrier, and it happens with everything, because it happens also if you're talking about men and women. When you say the men and the women, then you're making a separation that builds a wall. Hmm. And when you're talking about people coming from outside and you see them as different, you are building the wall. And in fact, one of our conclusions about the study of the walls is that they, they're unuseful. I mean, they don't use, people, they, they, they climb, climb, uh, climb the walls or they go down the walls or they go through the sea. So walls don't uh, stop migration to happen. It will happen the same, mm -hmm. but it's, a, it's like a, the architectural uh, expression of you are different. That's why Trump mm -hmm. wants to build a bigger wall, because you're different. So yes, in my opinion, we have to understand that we are all the same, that there's room for everybody, that it, it all will happen, that people has, has been moving. Yeah, and I just want to add, because the word integration itself, it's both way. Yeah. Otherwise, it's like forced marriage. Mm -hmm. So like there are people who are coming, and they have to integrate, mm -hmm. and they have to change values, and they have to. But then after a while, they become like mm -hmm. freaks. I mean, mm -hmm. you know? So integration goes both ways. Now, when you see in, my, in the city where I'm living, in Gothenburg, you see the churches that are open and trying to help the newcomers, and a lot of women, a lot of men are doing a lot of voluntary work. I mean, the society is changing. People are starting to think like, yeah, let's see, and maybe we should include them. If we want to do something about them, we should have them. You know, listen to them. We should not just come up with ideas on our own thinking, yeah, this is good. We know what is good for them, you know, yeah. this kind of patronizing attitude. But the problem is that we always saw the people that were not 
uh, that were from the third countries, from mm. the south, mm -hmm. as people we, we need to help. It the was, charity. It always has you, been yeah. a charity because mm. we saw them as different. Something very interesting is uh, we work with Michael Clement, which is a, a, is, um, a guy, he's amazing, uh, from the um, Center of Global Development in Washington. And Michael Clements is writing a book about uh, women vote. And what he said about women vote, and it's the same about uh, migration and refugees, was that at the beginning, people saying that women had to vote had arguments that, that were counter arguments. So the people were saying, no, if the women votes, the vote is going to be more conservative. And they were, no, 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 the vote won't be more conservative. But it did, it was going to be more conservative. Mm -hmm. mm. The change came when they said, why wouldn't women vote? Mm. Why? Give me a reason why the women shouldn't vote. Mm. This is the same. Give me a reason why the people shouldn't move. Give me a reason why the people could, can come to a country because they, they were born in another one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think it's good what I get is first our societies have to change, right? Not only the people who are coming have to change. And um, I would uh, like to continue with the, this idea of the wall that you mm. were talking about. You talked like twice now about it, that this wall are the architectural expression yeah. of us and them, of this division, and they're actually not efficient. <laughs> they're actually an imaginary of an efficient way of trying to keep people um, outside. They're not even working. No. Mm. It's a phantasma, this mm. uh, wall. Um, but still we're building them. At the moment, Europe is building them outside of its borders so that people cannot even, uh, that are stopped before the European border so that they don't die at the European borders and we don't have a bad conscience about it. Yeah. Um, I would like um, to come uh, to the situation of Spain. Um, so how is uh, the situation here? How is the situation with people arriving or actually not arriving because they're already stopped in Libya? And how are the people receiving um, uh, people who are arriving? Because we have already like two years now this uh, situation and maybe things changed for the good or the worse. Okay, well in Spain we have something that is very particular is that we have a border <laughs> of Europe in Spain which is in Melilla and in Ceuta, in Africa. Mm. We have mm. two towns with two big walls there, with people stuck there, with children stuck there. In Melilla, we have already uh, between uh, 300 and 500, because they don't know how many they are, children stocked without their parents, alone. And accompanied minors, yeah. Yeah, and accompanied minors, but we don't like to call them that. Mm. We prefer mm. to call them children. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and uh, 80 of them, they live on the streets. This is because of the war. Most of them, they're going to get stuck or they're going to come to the, to, to the peninsula, what we call, to, the, to, to Spain, uh, to Europe. In Spain, people, they don't feel, because we did, a, we did a, an inquiry, uh, no, how you say, a survey. And people, they said they like migrants. But uh, we're running out the test called um, IAT, uh, IAT, which is the perception that you have from something in your uh, subconscious. And we've done it, and it's the opposite. Mm. Everybody relates migrant with bad and Spanish with good. That doesn't mean the people, they don't like migrants. They want, to, they want to like migrants, but it means that inside of our consciousness, uh, we don't like migrants. We feel aggress and we feel them different. And this is because there's a speech which is about the difference. So uh, I think in Spain, we're not uh, having enough um, thoughts about what is going on. We are very focused on very small things which are bigger. And I think what's going on in Europe is going to touch us. And I think that once, and we were saying that before when we were talking, when you take out the rights of one person, you are allowing that your rights mm. get taken from you. 
and that's what we're kind of doing mm. in Spain and in the whole Europe. Mm -hmm. mm. And you, Rasha, mm. um, you're actually trying to establish an intercultural dialogue, yeah. as you say, between the countries northern of the Mediterranean, as you express it, and the countries southern, southern of, of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean because uh, they're actually both part of the problem, part of the solution, and how they deal with the question of borders, because this is, mm. there is this border of the European, uh, yes, the European uh, uh, refuge or the mm. European mm. Uh, geographical area. What is this intercultural dialogue? Look, I always, uh, I always say that to have a strong Europe or to have a strong European Union, you need a strong neighborhood countries. Like imagine yourself uh, living in a very poshy building, but all around you there is war happening. I mean, total instability. People are trying to come because they need refuge there. And so how actually strong you are compared to what is happening around you. And we, we need, we need to, to dialogue. We need to talk to each other. As an Egyptian, I feel closer to a Spanish or an Italian or a Greek, then probably a Greek would be with a Swede or a Dane. Definitely. We have a lot in common. There is a lot to dialogue about. I mean, our cultures, I mean, it was all moving. Like as an Arab who would visit the south of Spain, you would feel like home, Yes. you know? But talking to people again about the borders and the whole discourse about Barcelona or Catalonia and Spain, it's a discourse of wall. It's a discourse of borders. I mean, it's 2017. We really cannot have this discourse right now. And we need to dialogue with each other. And maybe leading to my last question, it's interesting you say in your spaces that you create, you have no borders. Um, but at the same time, we are in a situation yeah where uh, we have uh, the so-called summer of migration is two years ago. Things have developed since then, um, but we don't see borders uh, vanishing. On the contrary, we see walls uh, coming up, and we see a Europe that is not only reacting with cultural and artistic strategies, but is also uh, worsening the conditions for getting asylum status. Uh, some of them are practically abolishing uh, Schengen. Um, uh, only a very small part of European countries are actually accepting the people they are supposed to accept according to the last agreements of distribution of newcomers in Europe. And uh, so we have also um, a situation where it is not about, if, if we don't talk about borders, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. So my question to you uh, would be, uh, to you all, um, would be, okay, what did happen in the last two years? Where did we advance? And, and where are the problems that we cannot advance? Looking at the fact that we might do all this cultural intervention, but legislation actually is trying to, um, to uh, yeah, hold people outside of Europe. <laughs> Oliver, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think this uh, summer of migration in 2015 was probably the strongest sign of uh, refugees, of uh, people who want to come, uh, that it's possible to overcome borders. And it was for me, to, as for so many others, totally inspiring to see it. And, uh, I'm very glad that hundreds of thousands of people managed to enter the European Union and uh, many of them managed to, to stay here. And on the other hand, uh, the same images that uh, were, uh, that actually showed this self-empowerment of, of people were in the same day already used by conservative media and uh, uh, the yellow press in order to call for, uh, the, to, strength, to strengthen the border regime and to keep them out. And 
when we look uh, at the recent election results uh, in the European Union, I mean, we had Germany a month or two months ago and Austria two weeks ago and, and, Czech, and Republic. In our Czech Republic and many more. So we see that the right wing parties get stronger and stronger and with them uh, assumedly uh, also border regimes will become stronger and uh, more restrictive. And I think this also has something to do with this concept of the open border. I mean, in the European Union, we have uh, uh, nation states and usually the borders were open. And I think this is no solution. If we really want to fight against borders, we have to get rid of all of them and the concept of open borders does not function as it can very easily be introduced and can become a quite normal border as soon as the political discourse, as soon as the political will just shifts, shifts slightly. Mm -hmm. We are working in Borgosa on that very much. We're working, for example, on how the words were built because there has been like another three times the number of walls we had in 2010, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, so the first thing is that there's an industry of migration control yeah. that has been created, which is a big problem because right now, whatever we want to do, we have to face a structure which is making money, money from migration control. Uh, the second important thing is that everything began uh, with the two towers. Hmm. That was the beginning of the, of the like, uh, craziness, it yeah, it shifted. So that was, I remember when the two towers were crushed and I thought, this is an historical moment, something is going to happen. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize until I began to study the walls that the change was this one, that we we're building like a fortress because we felt the grass and we're building a silly fortress because this fortress we we're building will, won't help us to fight the terrorism, so it's ridiculous. Mm. I completely agree. Uh, what we say also in Porcaus is that if you open the borders, people, they don't move in a silly way. People look for having a good life. So if they don't find a good life in a place where they arrive, they will find a place where they can find a job, where they can be okay. okay. So if you leave, let the people move, they will find the places where they are needed. Because in Europe we have, a, 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 for example, in Spain, we are minus two on growth. Mm -hmm. So like we're decreasing yeah. our population. Yeah. So kind of we need people, mm -hmm. but we need people in legal ways. We don't need illegal people who cannot work or, or work on an illegal basis. You know, this is under, I mean, it's creating a silly mm -hmm. structure, economical structure. So we really think there is a way to prove that if you open the borders, that if you let the people come in an organized way, it's going to be good for everybody. And as Russia said, the mixture. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. We have to allow the people to be different. Open borders uh, with giving people legal statuses, organized way of them being here, working here, etc. And uh, allowing the mixture, you said. And Russia, what would you say are the challenges at the moment? Um, I usually, when I attend and watch things about the right wing and you hear about that, because unfortunately they are they are occupying occupying our media space and the noise. And but actually, yesterday one of the speakers here at the festival said that people. I mean, it was way worse before. I mean, we need to look back, it was way worse. And where we are right now, we achieved quite a lot. We're not there yet, but we should not be super pessimistic. On the contrary, like we should be inspired by the past and the change that we are leading. You need arts and culture to change the people because with the arts and culture, you are going to take down the walls in here. And if you take down the walls in here, people will not vote for the right wing or the populists. We are not born evil. Like we're not, I mean, like it's just the discourse and the fear. And that was one of the things that struck me 
when I moved to Europe to live for the last two years, the growing fear, for me, fear is one of the tools of dictatorship. This is what Bashar and Gaddafi and, and Mubarak, this is the biggest blow in the face of democracy. People who are afraid, people who are voting out of fear, political parties that are playing on this fear. And like you see, the the left or the socialists moving more and more right because of the fear to lose votes. So we need to tackle this. We are all humans. Go and talk to each other. Have the dialogue that we're talking and we're talking about. Like, but don't, don't let yourself fall into this fear. We need arts and culture that break down the fear, that break down the walls, that make us more open and more courageous to have dialogue with others. Because we grow. I cannot imagine a country that is turning down human resources. We, I mean, there are people, I don't understand these politicians, they are turning down human resources. People with skills, with knowledge, and you just say, no, because our values. I mean, don't you have any trust in your own values? Are, those, are your values in I Sweden or Spain so I, poor that anyone would come and just wash I away your love values? I that. This is, this is super, because it's like, they're going to come and we're going to have to wear burkas. And it's like, yeah. but what rubbish of values do you have? What rubbish of culture do you have? That you have a new culture coming and you wear burkas. So it's like, mm -hmm. Yeah, Fear. but That's you're super best, right. Uh, last word for our discussion. I love it. We need arts and culture in order to fight the fear in the heads of the people and uh, prepare <laughs> our societies, change our societies yeah. together with the newcomers. So I have to end this discussion. Thank oh. you so much for being here, <laughs> having this discussion with yeah. us. Uh, thank you for watching and see you next time in the next Talk Real episode. Ciao.